Hi, y'all. Sorry about so many videos today, but uh, this Christy Winters debate, uh, she's one of these people that either you say nothing or you have a lot to say. You could sp I could spend hours going through some of the gibberish that she likes to spout out into the world. I'm sorry, some of the wisdom she likes to share with the world. I could really take in and maybe give some thoughts and response to it. I could spend hours doing that. But in any event, um, feminists, when they want to talk about rape laws or legislature, whatever it is, uh, dealing with rape or sexual assault or crimes or whatever, uh, they seem to have like this pathological inability to correctly state what is and isn't true. So in the debate with, uh, with Sargon, Christy Winters was, well, she was, she's asking you to imagine a particular scenario. You've gone out drinking with some friends, and the following scenario uh, happened, so I'll just let her explain it. You go out with some friends for drinks and have an excessively good time. A few too many Jaeger bombs later, a friend takes you to his place so you can crash at his and you pass out on his couch. In the morning, you wake up with a foul taste in your mouth and also realize that you have dried semen on your lips and face. When you tell this to your friend, he informs you that after you passed out last night, he put his penis in your mouth and used it to get off. Clearly this is rape, right? You were orally penetrated while unconscious and unable to give consent. You've just been the victim of a crime, right? You've just been the victim of a crime, right? Not in Oklahoma. In the last week, a, state's, the state's, a state criminal appeals court decided that forced oral sex does not count as rape under the law in Oklahoma as currently uh, As it's currently written, she said. Okay, so um, here is an equivocation. There are many things, uh, many bad things that you can do that uh, violate a law that aren't rape. So she, she asks the question, uh, you know, a victim of a crime, right, or a crime's been committed or whatever it was, right? Not in Oklahoma, she says. So no crime in Oklahoma uh, because this is not classified as rape. Now, I, I looked at her references. This was to a Guardian article, and this article, unlike many on the subject, um, actually had a link to the decision from the, uh, the appellate court she was talking about in Oklahoma. Uh, by the way, for the people who were earlier talking about my taking on and putting off my glasses, I'll, I'll try not to replicate that in this video. I'll just put them on the once and then take them off after I finish reading. This is an incorrect assertion about the state of Oklahoma law. Uh, as I mentioned, the uh, or as I was trying to mention, the decision here uh, in the relevant appellate court, the Court of Criminal Appeals, which is the top criminal, the criminal court in the state of Oklahoma, uh, issued an opinion that was linked to in the Guardian article, and uh, which is rare. Uh, very often these cases aren't linked to, so you just have to believe whatever the reporters say or spend a lot of time trying to figure out what case they're talking about. But in this one, they had a handy link. And the uh, Court of Criminal Appeals uh, issued a two-page ruling uh, that includes the captions and the signatures on it. And one of the difficulties in talking about this kind of thing to someone like uh, Christy Winters, particularly in a live debate, but... Uh, you, you have to explain that we have an adversarial legal system where litigants, the parties, the people who have the beef that they want to get resolved, go to a court, an appellate court, or even the trial court, but when it's an appeal, they go to the court and they choose what issues to litigate and what issues to ignore. So this particular case goes up to this uh, appellate court where the state has a particular grief uh, with a decision made by the the judge in the case. So they, they raised one issue and only one issue, and that is the issue that was resolved by uh, the uh, their court. So um, they give the procedural history about the uh, fence. Uh, uh, there, was, there were two counts, or two counts are mentioned here. One was rape in the first degree, or in the alternative rape in the second degree, and count two was forcible oral sodomy. Um, the rape uh, the first and second degree rape uh, count, the count one, was dismissed. I don't know uh, whether that was with or without the consent of the prosecutor. They're not challenging that here, but clearly this doesn't qualify for first or second degree rape because that requires vaginal or anal uh, penetration, and this doesn't allege that. So it's left with the forcible oral sodomy, uh, or uh, Oklahoma statute 2011, section uh, 888. And that, uh, so 
The appellee pretrial, uh, appellee's pretrial motion to dismiss was granted on November 30, 2015 by the trial judge, and uh, the state comes before the court. The state's sole proposition of error is that the trial court erred in ruling that forcible sodomy cannot occur where a victim is so intoxicated as to be completely unconscious at the time of the sexual act of oral copulation. Finding no error, the state's appeal to this court is denied. The legislature's inclusion of an intoxication circumstance for the crime of rape, uh, section 1111A4, is not found in the five very specific requirements for commission of the crime of forcible sodomy, section 888B. As set forth in some case law of theirs, we will not, in order to justify prosecution of a person for an offense, enlarge a statute beyond the fair meaning of its language. So, um, in the scenario that she describes, uh, you clearly have a violation. Uh, the person is clearly aggrieved. They're clearly the victim of something. Uh, you have a very, very clearly you have a suspect, a perpetrator of that offense, of that crime, in this, in this uh, scenario as she has described it. Uh, there are many things you can do that are crimes that aren't rape. You can break into someone's home, not rape, still a crime. You can murder someone, not rape, still a crime. So this, this issue is going up to the court, not to say that uh, there was no wrong done here, that there's not been a statute violated. It's to, say, it's to challenge the, the, uh, the trial court's dismissal of this particular uh, crime, this pr particular charge. There is no question that there is an offense of some type that has happened. All that's being arbitrated here is what do you call the offense. So uh, it, it goes up. They're arguing about, you know, does the, the facts of this case, when you lay out what the facts are, you know, one, two, three, whatever they are, and you look at the statutes, you, you compare the facts that have happened in reality to the elements of a statute. Do these facts fit within these elements uh, for forcible sodomy? No, it doesn't and not for rape either. So apparently, according to Dr. Winters here, that means that in Oklahoma, you can get people drunk, you can knock me whatever, and fuck them all their sleep, in, at least orally, and uh, you've done nothing wrong. There's been no violation of the law, so clearly uh, the male-led legislatures have failed, the male-dominated legislatures have done this, as she said later in the video, uh, because of their, um, their views on women or some shit. Now, as, as I mentioned, you, know, you can do something and it not be rape and still be a crime. So here is, uh, well, the two sections we talked about were 1111, which is for rape, and then 888 for forcible sodomy. Here is section 1123, lewd or indecent proposals or acts to children under 16, and sexual battery. No person shall commit sexual battery on any other person. This is B, by the way. On any other person. Sexual battery shall mean the intentional touching mauling or feeling of the body or private parts of any person 16 years of age or older in a lewd and lascivious manner. One, without the consent of that person. Uh, this is a maximum penalty of 20 years in prison. <clears throat> so, uh, in, in taking this, this issue up, the court resolved the question before it. Does this conduct fit within the forcible sodomy statute? No, it doesn't. Uh, prosecutor, go away. You don't have you don't have a leg to stand on. So what I would say um, to this prosecutor who's complaining about not getting um, this charge reinstated, the forcible sodomy, is that in the future, what he as a prosecutor might want to consider doing is reading the statutes in his state and comparing the facts that have happened in a particular case <clears throat> against the elements in this particular statute and charging the person who has done the crime, done the, the bad thing, with the crime that, the, that they have actually committed. So you charge them with the statute that they have actually violated, rather than charging them with some unrelated statute that they haven't violated. That's the moral here. Now, later in the video, as I mentioned, she was talking about how male-dominated legislatures had this weird view about rape, where it was just uh, male penetration of a woman, and it was because of feminism that that uh, we've made such great progress and uh, that we need to do more so we can get this legislature, legislature to fix itself. Well, one of the reasons that um, there would have been another statute this could have been prosecuted under before 2003, but uh, in 2003, gay men, quite, with, quite without uh, reference to feminism, uh, took a case called Lawrence against Texas, which decriminalized uh, uh, sodomy statutes throughout the country. Um, in 
Oklahoma, they used to have a statute, uh, Crimes Against Nature, which, include, which included the conduct here. Whether or not it was consensual, it was still a crime. You, couldn't, you could not consent to that uh, for any particular reason. Uh, this is going back some time in, in Oklahoma law when it was applied to cunnilingus and fellatio, and then it was only to heterosexuals, and then anyway, whatever. It's a whole convoluted thing that I only read about for about 45 seconds because it, it wasn't that interesting. By the way, this doesn't take long to figure out if you just spend a little bit of time looking for it and know what you're doing, unlike Dr. Winters. And in any event, when that law was struck down, I'm pretty sure that what legislatures didn't think was, my God, I bet this has opened the door for uh, unconsensual types of things that we said was categorically prohibited. They probably didn't think about it, and they probably didn't say, we need to go patch any potential loopholes in, in the statutes because they didn't need to because they had this sexual battery statute already on the books, and I presume that legislatures thought that, uh, that uh, district attorneys uh, who were elected, I suppose, would hire staff attorneys, d uh, deputy district attorneys, and assistant district, uh, district attorneys who would be competent at comparing the facts in the real world against the elements of a criminal statute and then selecting like a catch-all statute to bring in this kind of bad conduct that is perfectly unlawful in Oklahoma and uh, that can get you 20 years in prison on your first offense. So uh, the distinction here that, that she's trying to, the equivocation is that if it doesn't say it's rape, she is saying that you have not committed a crime, which is just categorically false. It is highly misleading. Uh, but that is, is um, stock and trade for scholars, social, so-called scientists like Dr. Christy Winters. All right, you guys have a good day, and this will, this will be my last video for the day, I'm, I'm fairly confident. Have a great day.